Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the State of Java webinar. Today, we're going to discuss the state of Java. And we'll start with the recent lock for shell security issues, uh, discuss Java in the enterprise. Uh, also, we'll talk a bit about the JDK 17 LTS release and the upcoming JDK 18 release. Uh, and if we have time, we'll discuss Java on the cloud as well. So uh, before we introduce our panelists, what I would like to ask you to do as an attendee is if you have any questions, please use the question widget, which is in this GoToWebinar to ask us questions and I can relay them to our panelists this afternoon. So without further ado, uh, let's introduce our panelists and let's get going. So first off, I'd like to start with Simon. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, depending on where you are. Yes, my name is Simon Ritter. I am the Deputy CTO at Azul. Um, and yes, I do have a reasonable amount of experience with Java, having started work at Sun Microsystems way back in 1996, which does make me feel very old. Um, and I've followed Java really all the way through its history at Sun and then Oracle, and more recently, well, recently the last six years at uh, Azul. All right, Rudy? Yeah, so I'm Rudy De Visser. I'm working as product manager for uh, Payara. So I make sure that uh, all the features are in every release, uh, that they are good as uh, our users are expecting it. And I'm working about, uh, what, 15 years in Java. So I also know a few things. All right, thank you, Rudy and Simon. Uh, my name is Pratik Patel. Uh, I also work at Azul Systems uh, and I'm also a Java champion and have been coding uh, Java for as long as Simon has, unbelievably. So uh, yeah, I actually have my first book uh, in the back there right <laughs> behind me. So uh, that was published in 1995. So I've been doing Java for a while now. Um, anyways, let's get started real quick. Um, let's start with something a little simple and, well, maybe not simple, but what are some of the highlights that uh, we've seen in the Java universe in 2021? So we've seen the LTS release, but uh, please go ahead. Yeah, that, that was my my remark besides the JDK 17 then, of course, because that's the most important thing of last year. Um, if I need to pick one thing, then maybe it's that uh, also Microsoft uh, released uh, their um, version, their implementation um, of the OpenJDK distribution. So we are now with like eight or nine different uh, implementations. So that, uh, that means that... Uh, that the open source model of Java works very well, and that it is, uh, and that if everyone wants to contribute to uh, to the success of Java, and that uh, um, they all want to have their own version and their own specific uh, um, functionality and features in it for their users. That is great, I think. Yeah, I, th I think I'd kind of uh, add to that because, as you say, that's uh, quite a significant thing, especially for those of us uh, <laughs> who can remember way back to the, the beginning of Java and obviously Microsoft including Java and Internet Explorer and then deciding that they wanted to make a few little changes here and there which kind of broke compatibility. And then that led to, you know, um, I guess the creation of C Sharp and Microsoft not really supporting Java in the way that uh, we were perhaps wanted them to. And so obviously it's interesting to see that kind of come full circle. Um, I think for me, obviously JDK 17 was the big thing because of the fact it is an LTS release. And I think the other thing which we're, we're going to talk about in a moment was um, the vulnerability discovered in Log4j, which is Log4Shell. So I think those, those kind of things for me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's go ahead and dive into uh, the log for shell topic. Uh, if you don't know, which would be surprising if you work in the Java universe, uh, there was a CVE or security exploit that uh, came out uh, just before the holidays in December. Uh, and it was a pretty big deal. I, I know all of my friends in the Java world um, were a little busy. Uh, that weekend that it came out. So it, it, the, that exploit was um, uh, was widely known by, I think it came out on like a Friday morning or Friday afternoon. So uh, it it ruined a lot of people's weekends, but you know, it was a very, it was a very serious exploit. So let's talk about that for a few minutes. Um, so anyways, let's, uh, let's talk about that. Simon, why don't you give us uh, a overview of like what the exploit was and then we can take it from there. Yeah, I mean, 
this was one of those kind of very interesting situations because um, Log4j is a small open source framework. I mean, it is a logging framework. So you know, what kind of functionality are you going to include in that? You know, you, you're logging things. But one of the things they did was they, they used uh, a piece of technology, which was JNDI. And because of the way that they had used that, it enabled remote code execution to be uh, used through this, this framework. And why this became such a big thing was because even though it's a small framework, it's included in a lot of things. And even though people who are developing enterprise applications may not have used it directly themselves, the frameworks that they're then using to build their applications have then used it. And this sort of brings up some interesting issues around the whole open source software sort of development, because what we find is that, um, you know, you end up with aggregations of software where you use something like struts or you use something like spring, um, even IntelliJ as a, an IDE, and you'll find that they all use log4j. And it may be sort of several libraries away where it's being used. So it may not be struts that uses it directly, struts uses another library, which then uses log4j, and so it gets included. And, and that was quite significant because suddenly people were trying to figure out, are we using log4j? And therefore, do we need to patch our systems? And that became quite significant. And the other reason it was very significant was because it was what's called a zero day vulnerability, meaning that the vulnerability was announced before a patch was available to fix it. So the, the people who were maintaining the log4j library had to react very quickly to that. And I think um, it's, it's important to recognize that as an open source project, the people who are maintaining it are not paid for that. They're not employed by a company to do that. They do it in their spare time. I, I believe there's like three people who look after this particular framework. And they did an extremely good job of addressing the vulnerability as quickly as they could and getting that out there. Um, they did come in for some criticism, which I don't think was really justified in terms of uh, how this was dealt with. But, you know, it was a, that, that kind of vulnerability. And the kind of thing it brings up to me is really to understand that um, when you're dealing with software, open source software, commercial software, you need to make sure that you keep it up to date. So install all the security patch updates that are available to make sure your systems are as secure as possible. It was a zero day vulnerability. So even if you had your systems up to date, um, that wasn't going to prevent the problem. But as soon as the patch came out, people were trying to deploy it. Um, so yeah, um, I know Rudy's got some thoughts yeah. on this as well. Yeah, so let me interject really quickly. Uh, I think one thing that um, was somewhat miscommunicated in uh, some of the media outlets around this was that this was pegged as a Java bug. Uh, and I think it's important to realize that this was not a bug in Java or OpenJDK. It was a bug in a third-party library, albeit a very widely used third-party library. Uh, but that's, you know, that's something to bear in mind, uh, like Simon was saying, is keeping on top of keeping your libraries updated uh, and, you know, having a process around being able to update uh, underlying third party libs, whether they're internal, uh, proprietary or open source uh, is key to being able to, to, to come and resolve these uh, kinds of things very quickly. So, Rudy? Yep. Yeah, and also want to comment on that open source uh, aspect, which was uh, mentioned uh, during those press releases and, and also now. Um, it is not because it is open source that it is more vulnerable than any other uh, framework. Um, open source just means that yeah, the source is available, but um, I, I guess as with any kind of framework that you are integrating in your application, um, once it is integrated, it becomes more or less your responsibility to see how you are using it and if you are using it correctly. Um, for instance, with that log4j, um, that GNDI um, vulnerability could be easily um, eliminated by just setting a simple property that it was not um, expanding on expressions. So if you read the entire documentation, and that's also, an, I think, an issue these days. This. Um, if you read the entire documentation, what all the features are, and then you see, oh, um, I don't need this expression um, ev evaluation. Um, if you are checking, oh, this expression evaluation might you, um, result in some security issues, then you can just d d disable that by a simple, um, by si by a simple option. So 
that's uh, so that log for shell for me was I think a wake up call for a lot of people that they should really take care of what they are including in their application, not just include it for the sake of including it and then don't read about it, but really see what is um, required and uh, what parts are required, how you can um, mitigate any possible um, issues, et cetera. So I think that was a, a good wake up call. Sadly enough, it was uh, the uh, on the Friday, so it uh, ruined a lot of uh, people's there weekends, but yeah, mm. it's, so, so be it. Yeah, so there's a question from the audience. Uh, so George is asking, is there something about how easy it is to adopt third-party code? Uh, mm -hmm. So I think he's, I think what he's referencing is the, uh, the larger Java ecosystem, which has an amazing constellation of libraries to do virtually everything, right? That's what makes working in the Java ecosystem uh, so productive, is that we have the capability of not having to write a lot of low-level code. We can pull libraries, whether they're open source, sometimes closed source to be able to do things. Uh, but what are your thoughts on, on what George's question was? Again, his question was, uh, is there something about how easy it is to adopt third-party code? Yeah, I mean, uh, this is one of those things because, a, again, you're sort of looking at the open source software model and the big advantage of open source software is that you can access the source and that means that you can use it and the, the big advantage in addition to being able to look at the source code is the fact that it, it is free. So if you want to use that, you can pull, uh, you know, log4j from one place, you can pull a library from here, a library from there, and put them all together and build your application. And so you're obviously building on the work of others. And um, as the question asks, you know, is it, is it how easy is it to do that? It's, it's very easy to do that, but it, it relies on you as a developer having responsibility for making sure that when you use uh, external software, you know, that you need to have a level of trust in the way that software is developed. You should, you know, look at the way it's being uh, maintained, you know, and, and get details about that so that you, you have that confidence that, um, you know, that it's being developed in a, a, a responsible way. And also that if something does happen, that there will be there, people there in order to respond and to generate fixes for it. Because some projects, you know, people leave the project and so that it's not being maintained anymore. And that can expose you to all sorts of problems if there is a vulnerability. Yeah, I think I think there's something uh, a little bit interesting in George's question here, um, where he references, you know, third party code. And in this case, we're going to assume third party open source code. Uh, I remember in uh, the past, uh, I was working on a project where uh, we discovered a bug or what we thought was a bug inside of a closed source thing that we had bought. I don't want to name any specific names. Um, but uh, what I ended up doing was actually doing a decompilation of their, uh, of, of basically where, you know, we thought the bug was. And I was like, yes, there's a bug here. And then we had to go through this kind of process of convincing the vendor that, yes, there's a bug here. Here, hey, we decompile the code. They were unhappy that we decompile the code. But that's a different story altogether. Um, but, but I think this is one of the great things about open source because there have been other instances in the past where I've work, been working on something and we write a test case and then we write some more test cases. We discover there's a bug and then you can just go look at the source code, right? And it's like, okay, I'm using an open source tool like Log4j um, or whatever. And because you have access to the source code, you can, you know, not necessarily specifically for security vulnerability, but for bug, uh, you can very quickly go and find what the problem is. And, you know, if you're able to, uh, you can submit a patch and you can build it yourself if you need to, right? So this, I think there's there's quite a bit to, to be said for being able to have that freedom of being able to look at the code and being able to understand it better and possibly even patch it yourself if you need to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for instance, with that log for shell um, because it was open source, um, some people even used the vulnerability itself to create a patch for it so that um, that they explicitly triggered the vulnerability, but in a good way so that the um, the configuration was uh, adapted so that the the issue the issue was fixed on, on their system. So that is indeed much easier if it's uh, if it's open source than of course because you can actually see what's happening and and, and easier find find those things out, of course. 
Yeah, what, what Rudy's referencing, and I don't remember who it was specifically that came out with this um, this quick fix, which was uh, without having to actually change the Log4j library, you would just go and execute the exploit, but do it in such a way on a running system that it would disable the exploit from being yep. be able to use further. Yep. Oh, it was right. Volker, wasn't it? Volker Simonis, I think, came up with that. Yeah, that's right. And and then you know people started using it because it was like, hey, we can, we don't necessarily have to go into emergency mode and start uh, patching and upgrading production systems. We can just run this by ourselves a little bit of time until we can you know go and do a full release or whatever you want to call it. So, so yeah, that was an excellent, uh, excellent move by uh, someone in the community, and that was possible because it was open source, of course. So. Hmm. Yep. All right. So. Um, one of the things around log for shell was that um, it, it seemed like a lot of people in the community kind of overreacted, like, oh my God, and of course it's a huge security exploit. But, but once we moved past the initial part of that, um, what are some things that uh, you guys think that can be done by, by development shops to, to help to be able to respond to something like this faster next time it happens respond faster like like i said before um you always have the responsibility to um see how you're you are using a certain library uh, to make the op optimal configuration for your situation so i think that that is um that's that is an important thing and what I now um, experienced a few times uh, in, uh, in in January is that um, people overreact in the sense that oh um, there is a certain uh, vul vulnerability even with that log even with that log 4j and if you just uh, set that pr pr property you are not vulnerable anymore but they even say oh but there is still that vulnerability so we are not using it anymore even with the um, property that disabled the entire thing. So um, I have I have the uh, idea that people now really overreact and say, oh, we are not using any kind of product anymore or library where there are known vulnerabilities. But that is practically impossible because mm. you find it every day. And if it's not already disclosed, then probably it will be disclosed tomorrow because um, in any complex system, uh, uh, log for shell was now an exception, but most of the time it is a, a complex combination of factors that trigger the vulner vulnerability. So with any complex system, you cannot ex exclude that there will be an issue at some point in the future. So if, if people say we are not going to use it, well, that's a bit um, of overreacting. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, if you, if you look at software as a whole, um, you know, and you look at the CVE list that's published on the website, you'll find that there's basically CVEs, which are vulnerabilities associated with any software package. Um, and so if somebody says that they're not going to use a particular piece of software because it has vulnerabilities and therefore it's unsafe, um, then they need to look very carefully at everything they're using. And then they're going to end up not using software at all because everything has you know, vulnerabilities that have been patched at some point in its, its life cycle. And, um, and and as Rudy says, you know, when you get into things where you've got complex systems, that if we look at the JDK itself, that's seven and a half million lines of code. The ability to remove all potential security vulnerabilities from that by analysis is just impossible. You can't do it. So, you know, you're going to end up with with situations where you get vulnerabilities. And we have a way of dealing with that. Um, if you look at the JDK, we have four updates a year and each of those updates will contain any security patches relevant to vulnerabilities that have been identified in there in the last three months. And you know, on a normal sort of release update, you have somewhere between like maybe one or two. Um, the one we had last month had, I think, 14 in it, which was a very busy month for um, updates um, and vulnerabilities patches. Um, quite unusual. Normally, it's it's much lower than that, but they're addressed, and so you can update your systems. And most of the ones that you get are normally quite low in terms of the score, and the score tells you how um, critical they are to to patch. The log4j 
uh, vulnerability was a 10.0. That's as high as it gets. Um, in the last update, everything was no higher than a 5.6, which is a medium vulnerability. So it's, it's important to kind of keep the perspective on vulnerabilities. Right. So, uh, so you just mentioned about, you know, kind of being able to be a little staying aware of what's happening uh, in terms of security vulnerabilities. Let's shift gears a bit uh, and talk about uh, things that are going on in enterprise Java. Uh, so let's start off with uh, a quick discussion on uh, what's happening with, uh, for example, the uh, Java X to Jakarta namespace change. Uh, and you know, with the Jakarta EE10 uh, and some other frameworks coming up uh, with new major releases, um, what are some of the the challenges that, for example, Rudy, that you see uh, at Pyara with um, this namespace change that's happening, and you know, anything else you want to add in about uh, the new versions of Jakarta EE? Yeah, uh, maybe just uh, a few words on why that uh, namespace uh, changed uh, from Java X to um, to to Jakarta. Uh, so first, it was ja called Java EE under the uh, supervision of Oracle, um, and they own uh, they have as a trademark uh, the they are the owner of the Java um, name. So also Java X was part of that trademark. So when Java EE was um, donated to the Eclipse Foundation as an open source uh, framework, then of course it came with a Java X namespace, but um, that is still owned by Oracle. So um, you could see the code, you, you, we were allowed uh, to, um, to use the code, but not to change the code. Um, so that means that um, everything uh, is copied into a new, a new namespace, uh, the Jakarta namespace. But of course, that has um, a lot of impact eh? because um, everything uh, your your applications also use uh, those those APIs of, uh, for instance, the servlet specification or the or the REST specification, and you refer to those interfaces, which were in the Java X um, packages and now in the Jakarta. So you need to update um, your application, but not only your application also libraries that are um, um, you, you're using those APIs need to be updated, etc. So it is a whole cascade um, of things which is going on since a few years now. Uh, first with Jakarta EE 9.1, uh, 9 and later 9.1, where everything was moved to the Jakarta namespace. Uh, and now uh, Jakarta EE 10 will come out uh, because namespace change is done. We can um, include new functionality, new features, uh, which uh, which everyone awaits now, uh, which was a bit on hold due to that, due to the namespace change. But of course, it has a huge impact on um, library developers because probably they will min need to maintain um, <coughs> versions of their um, library product or whatever in two versions, uh, one with the Java X and one in with the Jakarta one, because not everyone will change overnight. Um, look, for instance, at the uh, rate that people are still using Java 6 or Java 7. Um, so that's the same with uh, with Java EE and Jakarta. So people, for some good reasons, uh, stay on, uh, on older versions. Uh, so there is a lot of maintenance going on now uh, between those two uh, types of uh, of of your code base. Okay, Simon, anything you want to add on uh, the enterprise side, uh, whether it's Jakarta or something else? Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, because uh, obviously uh, Rudy's um, sort of covered that in quite a lot of detail. I mean, one of the things I've seen is is the handover from the JCP because I'm on the, the JCP executive mm -hmm. committee. I've seen the handover from JCP to the Eclipse Foundation, and I, I think that what I would say about that is it has gone very smoothly. Um, obviously, there was the issue of the namespace change, which is 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 kind of a a big thing from the point of view of of like having to make changes to your source code, but it's it's really a kind of search and replace. Uh, wherever you see, well, actually, no, you can't do Java X to replace Jakarta, but um, right. it's it's relatively right. simple to do that. Um, so you can go through and make those changes. But I do think that both um, the JCP and the Eclipse Foundation have handled this very well in terms of the, the migration and, and having to deal with this issue of, of the renaming. Nice. All right. Speaking of migrations, uh, let's talk about Java 17 for a bit. Uh, as most of you probably know, uh, the latest long-term release 
of Java was Java 17, which came out back in September. And uh, with the new six month release cadence, Java 18 is around the corner. It's going to be March 22nd when it comes out. Uh, but let's um, talk a little bit about Java 17 since it is a LTS long term release. Um, what uh, what have you guys seen in terms of uh, interest or people migrating to Java 17 production code? You know that kind of you know I know everyone's interested in, it, but like what's what's the uptake look like and how are people migrating to it? How is all that going? Mm -hmm. I, I think the, the way what I've seen so far is people are very interested in migrating to JDK 17 because as you rightly say, it's the new long-term support release, which really means it's the, the release that people are gonna to move to from either JDK 11 or JDK 8. And if you're moving from JDK 11 to JDK 17, you've got the cumulative uh, changes of six intermediate releases. And that's great because there's lots of interesting new features around the language in terms of things like records and you know some pattern matching stuff and the switch expression and, and various things like that. So there's, there's some nice things that people will want to use there. But then there's also things at a lower level in terms of changes to the JVM, improvements in terms of performance and stuff like that. Um, the thing is that in terms of moving to JDK 17, I don't expect uh, anybody really will have moved to JDK 17 in production just yet because okay. people will be waiting for a couple of updates before they do that just so they can make sure there's no big issues in terms of, of the JDK 17 code base. There shouldn't be, but most people are fairly conservative. If they're using the long-term support releases, they're going to want to wait a little while to do that. So um, yeah, I think that we'll see more uh, adoption probably later this year in terms of production systems. Yeah, we also re received, I think it was already in November or something of last year that people are waiting to have the DPR server running on JDK 17. So there are always people which are very quick to jump. But um, I think the majority, uh, mainly of the, the, the people which are um, running on JDK 11 will make probably the switch by the end of this year to JDK 17. Mm -hmm. because this time the switch between 11 and 17 is not that problematic as we had between 8 and 11. Um, then there were many changes. Uh, we had that modularity which broke a few things um, if if you can call it like that. So um, this time there are a few things which are uh, shielded off uh, some internal um, AP, AP, People call it API, but it is not the API because it was not public. Well, it meant to be public, but <laughs> everyone used it uh, like that. So um, there are a few, let's call it classes, uh, packages which are now again um, um, stowed away, uh, so that that you cannot access them anymore. Um, but other than that, there are no major issues in my point uh, point of view. So I believe that a lot of people will switch to 17 rather quickly. Okay or they stay at eight or seven or six or whatever they are currently. Um, another maybe interesting um, remark I heard a few times was that some people were a bit disappointed about what was in JDK 17. So they, they did not find it um, very spectacular. And of course, if you um, compare it with JDK 11, that's of course true, but um, the, uh, the number of years between eight and 11 is, uh, was much more than between 11 and 17. So there was um, much more time at that point. And I guess not everyone is aware because, okay, you have those records and, and, and text blocks and, and the, the helpful null pointers exceptions. That is also one of the, of the, of yeah. of the mentionings. Um, but there are a lot of other things uh, like uh, Simon mentioned uh, around performance, uh, around the garbage collectors, et cetera, and um, like the dynamic class data sharing option now, et cetera. So there are a lot of things which not everyone is aware, which is now available. So um, I think uh, JDK 17 is a, is a good one. Probably people are waiting a bit about around Project Loom, Valhalla, Amber, those mm. kind of things, which takes quite some time, but um, I think it's uh, we have good progress overall. So. Yeah. yeah, so there's a question from the audience uh, from John. He says, my application is still on Java 8 in production, looking to upgrade 
should I go to 11 or 17? So before I toss it over to you guys, uh, I would just like to say, John, uh, at least you're not on Java 6 or 7. <laughs> <laughs> right? That would be an even bigger jump. Uh, I'm just joking, of course. Um, but um, Simon, why don't you start real quick by telling us, like, you know, for example, Azul still supports those older versions of Java, but just give us an idea of like, you know, uh, what we see at Azul in terms of people still using those really old releases. And then and then see if we can give uh, John some insight into whether he should jump to 11 or 17. Yes. Um, so as you as you rightly say, you know, we actually support all the way back to JDK 6, which is the oldest version that we can support under OpenJDK because that's the the earliest version that you can build from source. Um, it actually wasn't the the version that was originally released. It was JDK 7 that was originally released. And then they, they actually did a, a back port of JDK 6. They, they, they rebuilt JDK 6 from JDK 7, but I, I, I digress. Um, so yes, I mean, if, if people are still using those, then, then we can still provide security updates and bug fixes for those releases, which is very good for a number of people because there are people out there who are running systems and they're just not in a position to be able to upgrade to a newer version of the Java platform. And it's the old adage of if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So if they can continue to use it, great. But for people who are looking to make that switch, and you know, as the, the question from John asks, uh, he's on JDK 8 and should he move to JDK 11 or JDK 17? My advice would be to move straight to JDK 17. The, the big sort of issue as, as Rudy's already sort of mentioned is the once you move off JDK 8 and you're moving forward then because JDK 9 was where modularity was introduced anything after 8 includes modularity modularity is the thing that um, can have an impact on the ability to move forward in terms of newer versions and really the the significant thing there is the encapsulation of those internal classes that has um, cause some issues with libraries and frameworks and things like that. And there's some issues around reflection and things. But if you have an application, and, and I can say this you know, fairly well, if you have an application that just uses the standard Java SE APIs um, and third-party libraries, um, then you should be fine except if your third party libraries have used any of these internal APIs but if your library if your classes are only using the the, inter the sorry the java se APIs then there won't be any issues moving from java 8 to anything later um, it's only when you get some of these um, special classes like sun misc unsafe that are being used that can cause some issues um, but i think that if you're looking to move from 8 to a newer version because the the difficulties are in moving to nine and later then there really isn't any difference moving to 11 or 17 and you can take advantage of all the good things in 17 rather than having to move to 11 and then to 17. Yep. so rudy you mentioned a few minutes ago when we were talking about enterprise um what pyara is doing with jdk 17 so again john's question was should he jump from jdk 8 to 11 or 17. Um, well, what we always um, advise is maybe first is that you run Payara server on JDK 11 or 17, but your uh, web application is still compiled on JDK 8. So then, the, then you don't need to change your application yourself, uh, but you have already the benefits of, for instance, that uh, performance issues that you see in, J in JDK 17. Once you have done that step, then the next step could be that you change your compilation level of your app application to JDK 11 and see how th th that goes, etc. So um, you can do it step by step. It, it's not a big bang anymore. Um, we are able to run um, an application even compiled uh, on 8, 11 or 17 on the latest version. Um, so you have now many more options uh, than before and a gradual uh, migration, in my opinion, is always a more easier part than try trying to do everything at once. Okay, I, I, I'd just like right. to add a little bit to that because I think really makes a, a really good point here, which is the ability to take compiled code on JDK 8 and run it on top of 
Pyara, which is running on top of JDK 17. And that ability in Java to take older compiled code and not have to recompile it to run on newer versions of Java is one of the real powerful things. And one of the things that has led to the popularity of Java as a platform is that ability to do that. And I mean, I haven't, I haven't kind of tested it recently, but I know I've, I've taken uh, applications that were actually compiled on JDK 1.2 and they will still run on the most modern versions of Java without having to recompile them. There were some issues, if you go right back to 1.0 and 1.1, there were a couple of things that did change, um, and only some of those were run on the newest versions. But 1.2 onwards, you can pretty much take any compiled code and run it straight on uh, a newer version. Yep, that's absolutely true. One of the great things about the Java platform is its amazing backwards compatibility, right? That's mm. I don't think any other platform really uh, offers that. Uh, and speaking of backwards compatibility, we're talking about migrating to Java 17. <laughs> and we're about, what, uh, five weeks away, six weeks away from the Java 18 release. Uh, so we'll be doing a, a webinar uh, as we get closer to the JDK 18 launch. Uh, so please tune in for that. We'll fill you in on what's happening with that. It's not super exciting, but you know you can still join us. and get our take on what you need to do to get ready for it and stuff like that. So uh, keep an eye out for that. Uh, and we're already in overtime, uh, but I think this question or this topic uh, will be on the minds of a lot of folks, which is Java and the cloud. So let's segue to that for a few minutes uh, and talk about you know Java on the cloud. Uh, I know that cloud for Java devs, most Java devs, cloud is a big thing. Um, and you know there are people out there who talk about how, well, you know, there are, there are other platforms which are good for the cloud or better for the cloud than Java. And of course, the folks on this call will probably disagree with that. But uh, <laughs> let's uh, let's start a short discussion about, you know, just Java in the cloud or anything else uh, you all have on your mind in terms of basically where things have gone in 2021 for Java on the cloud and other kind of advancements in the Java space and, and where we're going in 22 for that. Yeah, well, I find it a bit strange that you that some people say, well, Java is not suited for the cloud because why would it not be suited? It is just um, your JVM runs um, also in containers or in, in all those cloud environments. So um, why should not you should not you, you use it? You are familiar with with uh, all the all the structures and the and the way that you um, could write your application. So. Um, why should you learn something else? Because for me, the most um, and the most difficult part of, of 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 going to the cloud is dealing with the dynamic um, the dynamic aspects of of the cloud. That um, you need to start up more containers based on on load, etc. But that's more infrastructure related. That's not your application related. Is about Spinning up a new instance, make sure that the routing also finds that uh, those endpoints on that new instance, but that's not related to Java. So I don't see any problem um, of using Java for any kind of application that you try to running. Maybe there is one thing which, um, but there are a lot of um, things uh, going on on that area lately is um, is the startup time because people say. Well, three seconds is really too long. Then I always ask, really, is that is that the issue that um, three seconds is too long and and one second is not is is good? So, but other than that, um, I think uh, why not use Java what you are used to and work uh, with that on on your next project, which is cloud. Yeah. So, so Rudy, uh, it, someone from the it, I'm glad you mentioned startup time because someone from the audience, uh, George, asked. Uh, I think raw VM native will be a game changer for cloud. What are your thoughts? So, Simon, what do you think? Yeah, so th this is interesting um, because, you know, as, as Rudy rightly says, you know, one of the things that, that people criticize Java for in terms of a, a cloud environment with a microservices architecture is startup time. And what we mean by startup time is, is really how long does it take to get to the optimum level of performance? And because we use bytecodes and we use JIT, adaptive compilation, it takes time to compile the methods that we want to use because we need to analyze it as the code's running and do the compilation. Now, the idea behind Graal VM, and specifically um, as the question asks about native image, 
is essentially what you're doing is you're saying, okay, let's take our Java code and let's compile it before we run it, which is, you know, the same as you do with other languages, um, you know, like C and C++, it's static ahead of time compilation. Now, that has some advantages in the sense that you get very fast startup. So you're running machine code straight away. Great. But the issues come in, especially with Java, in terms of how you can actually compile that code because ahead of time compilation is very limited, well not very, but it is much more limited in terms of the optimizations that you can make compared to just in time compilation. To give you an example, one of the most common optimizations compilers use is method inlining. You take the code of the method and rather than popping a stack frame on, or pushing a stack frame on, executing the method, then popping the stack frame off, you simply take the code and put it into inline. Now, if you're using Java and you do static compilation, because Java is a dynamic language, not stat dynamic typing, but dynamic from class loading, you can't know for certain at runtime exactly which method will be called because somebody could load a new class and you end up calling a different method. So you have to be more conservative in your method inlining. Whereas with JIT compilation, you can be more aggressive in terms of that. And the other really big thing with JIT compilation is speculative optimizations. You, you basically say the code has done this up until this point in time. I will assume that the code will do this from the rest of the time onwards. And you can really optimize very heavily based on that. Now with, with native ahead of time compilation, again, you can't do those speculative optimizations because you don't have the ability to de-optimize, which is what you need. Um, so GraalVM native images are very good for certain types of applications. If you look at things like um, lambdas on AWS, serverless computing, where you're doing a function, very short-lived, you know, stateless kind of thing, then yeah, GraalVM will be effective. But anything that you want to run for any longer period of time as a service, then you've got to balance that fast startup versus the lower level of performance you'll get overall based on the native image. Now, GraalVM will also tell you that we can do profile guided optimization where you run the application and then you take that and you feed it back into the compiler. But there's, there's still limitations on that and there's limitations on what you can actually do with Java code from the point of view of you can't do reflection, you can't do class loading, all sorts right, of stuff right. like that. So um, from my point of view, GraalVM is interesting. There are certain situations, like I say, where it's good, but for a lot of situations, you need to look at what is the overall performance that you're looking for in your application. Okay, uh, so so we're almost at the end of time. Uh, I do want to get some closing thoughts in just a second, uh, but I just wanted to mention that we have a couple of great webinars coming up. Uh, we're doing a webinar series actually on uh, Neo4j, which is a graph-oriented database, um, which will be on March 8th, I believe, at the end of this month. Um, and then, of course, we have the webinar on JDK 18 coming up. And we also have a very exciting webinar on Azul's new cloud native compiler coming up. So uh, keep an eye out for those webinars. Uh, we'll let you know when uh, they will be happening and so you can sign up for those. Uh, but before we wrap up here, um, why don't we get some closing thoughts? Uh, let's start with Rudy. Yeah, for me, um, Java is, um... I think already for 15 years, almost at the top of the ranking uh, of all the computer languages. Um, there is now with those six months releases and those LTS releases, there is uh, a good cadence. There are a lot of opportunities uh, to improve. So there is still a lot of things going on. Um, so for me, um, probably because I love Java from day one that I worked with it, but I'll. Yeah. I don't see any reason why it should not try for the next year. So, um, yeah, I would say keep an eye on all those things, uh, um, all those new features. Keep an eye on Jakarta if uh, EE, if you're uh, interested in that. Uh, for instance, uh, there is that release of Jakarta EE 10 in May, uh, with, uh, which we uh, which we also will follow with uh, with with PA6, etc. So. Um, I think the main thing is you love, if you love programming in Java, why would you change? So um, I think uh, whatever is is going on, uh, this it is uh, used by a lot of people. So um, it is to be a great language and for a lot of people. Simon? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, I fully agree with, with what Rudy says there. Um, you know, I, I obviously have a, a passion for Java. Um, but, but more than that, it's, it's a passion for the whole idea of the JVM. So even if you don't think that Java is the, the perfect language for you, there's still alternatives that will compile into bytecodes and you can take advantage of the JVM. So you could do Scala, you can do Kotlin, you can do Clojure. Uh, you know, there's many, many languages that will compile into bytecodes. So the power of the Java platform is is just, you know, is, is great. And that's one of the things in terms of JVM that has led to the popularity of Java over the, the 27 years are we now um, mm -hmm. uh, since the release and I think that uh, Java will continue to evolve in, in a very con sort of measured way and I, I do have to um, say that I think that people like Brian Gertz and Mark Reinhold have been doing an excellent job of evolving the platform in a, a carefully controlled way so that we're not making radical changes but we are taking some small steps, eliminating some boilerplate code, some of those rougher edges just to make developers' lives easier. So I think it's all good stuff. And we'll see things like Loom and Valhalla eventually. Yeah, yeah. So so I think my closing thought is uh, there's lots of interesting and, and, and great ideas coming into uh, the Java platform over the next few years. Uh, Simon mentioned a couple of those already with Valhalla, Valhalla and Loom. Uh, but I just want to end our webinar today on um, something that I saw uh, posted online, which was, I believe, in the Guardian newspaper, which is a UK publication. And they had an infographic of the top 10 jobs in the UK. Oh, Guess yeah. what number yes. one was? <laughs> Java developer. Java developer, right? So obviously, uh, the technology is great. Uh, people who work in the Java ecosystem uh, love it. Um, you know, it has the best job, apparently, in the UK right now. Uh, but I think the future is very bright. We have tons of great features coming out the rock solid platform uh, to build stuff on. So, all right, so uh, with that, uh, we'll go ahead and close out the seminar today. Uh, we thank you for coming. Keep an eye out for those upcoming webinars and see you next time. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, bye. Bye.